In this section, we'll discuss potential energy and conservative forces. As we'll see, we can actually formulate a lot of problems just using the energy uh, of a system. Uh, and in this section, we'll discuss how to convert forces, uh, a certain class of forces, into energies, specifically into potential energy. Now, in order to define a potential energy, we have to restrict the forces that we're willing to consider uh, to a class of forces called conservative forces. And one of the key requirements for a force to be conservative is that the force felt by a system depends only upon the position. So in this case, we're looking at the force of gravity, and you can see that the force of gravity only depends on the radial distance between the two gravitating masses. Uh, it's possible that you can have forces which depend on velocity or the time history of a system. We discussed uh, air resistance, friction. Those are types of forces for which it is difficult to formulate potential energy uh, formalism and they are not considered conservative forces. Force of gravity, however, uh, only depends upon position and therefore is a conservative force. And oftentimes we can even consider non-conservative forces by just introducing corrections to our formalism. The line integral for a conservative force in going from point one to point two, that will not depend for a conservative force on the trajectory. It will only depend on point one and point two. By contrast, a non-conservative force will do different amounts of work depending on the trajectory taken in going from point one to point two. So for example, the force of friction would do a lot more work along trajectory C than along trajectory B because trajectory C is a lot longer. So if we want to write uh, the work done by a frictional force on our system in going from one to point two, it's written in this way. Here, L represents the length of the trajectory. So how long of a path did our particle take in going from point one to point two? And you can see that that results uh, in a work that will be bigger if L is bigger. By contrast, the work done by a conservative force only depends upon the difference between point one and point two. So here, for example, there's the force of gravity near the surface of the Earth. The work done by the force of gravity uh, is proportional to h, uh, the difference in height between point one and point two. It doesn't care how long a path you took in going from point one to point two. So for example, going back to our sketch here, if point one and point two represent two different heights uh, above the surface of the earth, all of these three different trajectories result in the same work done by the force of gravity. And so the book defines two conditions for a force to be considered conservative. The first condition is that the force only depends on the particle's position. It doesn't depend on the velocity, the time, any other variable. Condition two uh, requires that the work done by the force in going from point one to point two is the same no matter the trajectory. The upshot of this is that we can define a potential energy u, which is just a function of position, that will be defined as the negative of the work done by a force in going from some initial position r naught to the position r. And so then, of course, that's equal to the negative line integral in going from r naught to r. Now, uh, the potential energy u of r is always defined to have a zero point somewhere in space. So in this case, our zero point is r naught. Um, and so what we turn out to be interested in is just changes in the potential energy. And in order for us to be interested in changes, we have to have some sort of zero point uh, against which we define all of our potential energies. Okay, so why do we uh, equate the work done by a force with a potential energy? Well, remember the work kinetic energy theorem we saw in the last section, which tells us that the change in kinetic energy for a particle is equal to the work done by forces in going from position one to position two. And since we've now defined a change in the potential energy to be equal to the negative of the work done by the forces, we can see that the change in the kinetic energy can be written as negative the change in the potential energy. So any change in the kinetic energy for conservative force will result in a change in the potential energy. And the upshot of this is that any change in kinetic energy is balanced by a change in the potential. So that means the change in the sum of the kinetic and potential energies for a system is zero. So you add the kinetic energy to the potential energy, 
and you ask how it changes subject to conservative forces, you'll find that it, it doesn't change. That sum always remains fixed. In other words, the total energy of the system is a fixed quantity when we consider only conservative forces. And that's why we call them conservative. We mean uh, they conserve the total energy of the system. So for instance, if we have a change in the kinetic energy due to, say, gravitational force plus a change uh, due to a spring force. So we have a, uh, a mass on a spring suspended in a gravitational field. Both the gravitational and the spring forces have potential energies associated with them. So any change in the kinetic energy of the mass at the end of that spring uh, is going to be exactly uh, equal to negative the change in the gravitational plus the change in the spring uh, potentials. Now if we do happen to have non-conservative forces acting in the system, for example friction, now we have a pretty simple way of incorporating their effect on the total energy of the system. Those non-conservative forces of course can do work still, so here for example is an expression showing the work done by friction. Those non-conservative forces are constantly, uh, in this case, removing energy from the system. But we know that the conservative forces, uh, they will not change the energy of the system. And so then we can equate a change in the energy of the system, delta E. That's going to be a change in the, uh, the sum of the kinetic and potential energies. The only change that's allowed is the work done by non-conservative forces. And so even in the case we have non-conservative forces operating, we can still formulate our problem in terms of the change in the energy of the system. The book provides a, a pretty nice example uh, of a case where we've got conservative and non-conservative forces acting. For this block, we can write the potential energy from a gravitational acceleration as mg times y, where y is the height above the surface. Now since the frictional force is doing work, it's essentially removing energy from the system. And so we can write that the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the potential energy, that has to be equal to the work done by the friction. So if we imagine that the block starts out at the top of the ramp with zero velocity, then the change in its kinetic energy at any point is one-half mv squared. So the change in its potential energy, of course, is related to how far down the block it slid. And so that's given by d, the length of the block, times the sine of theta, excuse me, the angle of the incline. And then that has to be equal to the uh, work done by the frictional force, which, of course, remember, is just the friction uh, force times the total displacement in this case, since the friction force itself doesn't depend on position, it's a constant, and so that line integral just becomes the frictional force mu mg cosine theta times d, the total length uh, of incline slid down. And so we can rewrite this top equation as the bottom equation and solve for the velocity as a function of distance down the ramp. And so now we have that the velocity of the, of the block as it slides down the incline is just given as the square root of all of this here. This first term, this is just the, the change in the gravitational potential. And so if we had no friction, this would be the only term we have under the, the uh, solution for the velocity. Because we also have friction, you can see that this term is, all, is always reducing the velocity. And so we have a velocity that's smaller than we would have if there were no friction.